All right, so I've got RAM pulled up here, and I'm going to walk you through a, uh, a basic example of how to use RAM. And the building that I'm, I'm going to walk you through is actually going to be a, a, a much taller structure. I'm probably going to do something like an eight-story building because I want you to get kind of an idea as to how, uh, how RAM works. And I'm going, to do it, I'm going to do a very, very simple one. The, uh, like I said, the example and the tutorial that's on the website has slab openings and angled columns and circular grids and whatnot. It's got a lot more going on than, than what I'm going to do, but I want to give you kind of an idea as to what's going on. So I'm going to create a new file, and just so everybody's clear, I'm just going in the top, just, you know, new. And I've got this little file here. I'm going to call it, um, we'll call it class example. Um, you can specify your units right here on the bottom. We'll go with English units, so save that. Okay, and there we go. Now, the way that, that RAM works is, is you go through each of these sort of modules one at a time. So there's the RAM modeler, there's the steel beam, uh, steel column. You've got concrete beam, concrete column, so on and so forth. You can do foundations, uh, frame stuff for uh, seismic and drift control and whatnot. But we're going to go through each of these one at a time to sort of give you kind of an idea as to how this works. So let me go into model. Okay, so here's the modeler, and uh, the modeler, you know, it, obviously, it starts out uh, blank. It also starts out assuming that you're working in steel. If you go over here on the top left, you know, you can change that to steel, joist, concrete beam, you know, so on and so forth. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, model and, and generate a steel building, just to give you kind of an idea as to how this works, and then you all can take this and, and work on your own uh, structure. Now, the first thing that I need to do is I need to create a grid, okay? Now, what I mean by a grid is, uh, you know, if, we're, if you're looking at a floor plan of a building, I mean, you've seen these types of grids before, you know, like column B4 and, you know, B or girder C2, C3 or what have you. I need to create that grid um, uh, uh, that, that I would apply. So let's, um, let's create a grid. Um, we'll call this grid, I don't know, floor plan. And uh, we have two types of grids that we can generate, an orthogonal grid or a radial grid. So a radial grid is if you had a circular floor plan or something. We're just going to go with an orthogonal grid. So we'll add that. Now, the way that this is working is it's, start, it's placing that grid at 0, 0. That's where the offset and the you know, x and y offset, and it's also it's not rotated. But depending upon your, your project, I mean, you can, you've got a, a pretty fair degree of customization that goes with this. Now, I'm going to go into this grid and edit it a bit, and I think you'll see what I'm doing. So if you look here, you've got X grids and Y grids, and uh, you'll, you'll see this is pretty straightforward. So let's say along the X axis, I've got numbers, so like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on and so forth. So we'll start off with our grid label. We'll say it's grid 1, um, and we'll do... I don't know, 30 foot spacing, and we'll do nine of them. I don't know. And then hit add. And what it does is it automatically generates that. So you can see we've got grid label ones at zero feet, and then twos at 30, threes at 60, fours at 90, fives at 120. So see how it's doing that? It automatically figures out how to number it, and it automatically figures out where they are by, by spacing them out uh, accordingly. Now, for the Y grid, if I use numbers on the, uh, the X axis, maybe I'll use letters on the Y axis. So I'll go to the Y axis, and I'll say, all right, let's do A. And, I don't know, let's space those out at, let's make it interesting. Let's do 25 feet. And let's do less of them. Let's do, like, 6 and hit Add. Okay, now what it's doing is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it's doing those at every 25 feet. So 0, 25, 50, 75, 100, so on and so forth. Everybody okay with that? So you all should be able to create something very similar for your building, and, and it, should be, uh, it should be pretty simple and pretty straightforward. So we'll hit OK on that. Okay, so now I've got the grid created. So we're going to reference that grid here in a quick second. I just want everybody to be aware of that. Okay, now, what we're going to have to do, all right, 
sign-in sheet is making its way around. If you um, go ahead and get that, I'm, I'm, I'm recording our, uh, our RAM steel uh, introduction. I'm going to create a, a series of, of layouts for the building. Now, like I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, do something like an eight-story building. And I'm doing that for a very specific reason, because I want to show you how layouts and stories and whatnot and so on and so forth uh, all come together to generate a, a full-scale uh, model for a, for a given building. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a series of layouts that we're, that we're going uh, to detail. Now, the way this is going to work is this. I'm going to create, like I said, an eight-story building, but I want you to think about the geometry. Let's say I've got an eight-story building. So I've got a roof and then seventh floor, sixth floor, fifth floor, fourth floor, so on and so forth. All those floors are kind of the same, you know, as long as I've got a, a, a prismatic cross-section. So what I'm going to do is I'm only going to have two types of floors, and I'm just going to keep reusing those floors over and over again to create this building. So I'm going to say I've got uh, a typical floor, typical floor, and we'll say the roof. And the only thing that's going to make the roof different than the rest of the floors, I'm going to use joists on the roof as opposed to uh, uh, floor beams. So we'll hit add and we'll say okay. Now let me go ahead and select the floor. The, the, the floor is the one that I'm going to work on first. So if you notice here, if you look here on the top, uh, this drop down box, now I've got two different floors that I can use. So let's go with typical floor. Now what I need to do with this typical floor is I need to assign that grid. So we'll go to layout, grids. Now I need to select a grid. So we'll select the floor plan grid. We'll go ahead and do that for the roof as well. Hit OK. And now I've got my grid. Okay, so now you know I created a grid. Now I need to apply that grid to a, to a given layout. So if I'm looking at the t uh, floor, and it looks exactly like we said. So I have A, B, C, D, E, F, G on the Y axis. And on the x-axis, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Everybody see the labels there on the bottom? Like I said, I'm just making up the numbers. I just want to give you all kind of an idea as to how this, uh, this program works. Okay. So now we need to start creating our actual framing, you know, putting in the beams, putting in the columns, putting in the, the so on and so forth. So let's, let's put in some beams. Okay. So let's see. Layout, beams. And then let's add on grid, okay? So let's see. We'll do some gravity uh, beams. Let's say that they are composite beams. We'll use 50 KSI. We're going to use an I section. And let's do, let's do some single ones. So what I can do is I can say bam to bam, there's a beam. Bam to bam, there's a beam. And so on and so forth. If I'm getting lazy, I can say layout beams, we'll say add on grid, but instead of doing single, let's do a fence, and then I can, is that not working? It should work. Layout, beams, add on grid, fence, what is going on here? Layout, beams, add on grid, well fine, I'll do single. Oh, maybe it's where I'm remote desktop connecting. It doesn't really like this very much. I don't know. Let me try this one more time. Layout, beams, add on grid. Come on. All right, we're fine. We'll do it difficult. We'll do it the difficult way. Oh, I know why. I know why. I know why. We need to do the columns first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's what did it. Let's delete fence. Let's delete all of these. Okay. That's what it is. Okay. Let's do the columns first. So we'll add on grid. And what I'll do is this. Okay. So let's do the columns first. So let's do a standard column. Let's do gravity columns for now. And if you look over here on the bottom, or on this, uh, this uh, instance right here, am I orienting the columns this way or am I orienting the columns this way? We'll go ahead and say that they look like this and we'll do a fence. 
Now I've got columns everywhere. Do y'all see that? See the columns? See them right like that? Now, this is actually sort of an incorrect way of modeling the building, but I'll explain that here in a second. Um, we're going to do gravity columns for now, then I'm going to go in and tweak the way this looks, and, uh, and, and you'll see. So here I've got the columns laid out. Now let's see, let's see if the beams work. So beams, add on grid, fence. There we go. Okay, so what I've got now is I've got beams um, framing into all the columns, but what I don't have, what I don't have are individual beams between the bays. And this is, you're going to find this is pretty nifty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to layout, let's go to beams, and I'm going to go where it says add generation. Okay, let me show you how this works. Okay. So we're going to do gravity beams. We're going to say they're composite. We're going to say they're 50 KSI. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a number of equal spaces per beam. Now let's keep this simple and let's say that we're using four spaces per beam. Okay, does everybody see that right here? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit add. Now watch this. We'll draw a line from here to here. And then if you notice, see how this little white bar popped up? The little white bar popped up? What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this side up here and see what that did. So it split each of those beams up into four spaces and it added a generation of beams on this side. So for instance, if I drew, you know, from if I went layout, beams, add generation, and I went from, say, here to here, I could pick up or down. If I pick up, you know, somewhere up here, it adds those. See what I mean? Or I can go from here to here. If I click down, it'll add those. Does that make sense? So then I can, I can finish these pretty easily. So I can go, bam. Bam. Okay, so there, there's my, my beams laid out for the structure. And I can add regions with more spacing, with more beams, with less beams, so on and so forth. Okay? Now, that's the floor modeled out. Okay? Now, so now I've got my floor, at least the framing, figured out. There's two things that, two remaining items that I would at least, from a rudimentary uh, perspective, need to add to this. I would need to actually add a slab. And I would need to add a, uh, a, a loading. Is there an 80 PSF reducible live load? You know, uh, what have you. But let's have some fun with it. Let's actually create the building. Okay? Now let's say that this is the second story of the building. But it's also the third story of the building, the fourth story of the building, the fifth story. That these stories all look the same. Right? Let's say they all look the same. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into, see where it says story? Right here on the top? Right there where it says story? Okay, we're going to go to story, and we're going to create a, a few stories for this building, okay? So, let's say that the first floor is the ground floor. So, we'll say the ground floor is the first floor. So, it doesn't have any framing. It's just right there on the ground. So, let's say we've got the second floor. Oh. And let's keep the numbers simple. Let's say the floor-to-floor -floor height is 12 feet. Okay, so I think on our building it's a little bit more, right? So let's, let's just keep it simple. Let's say it's 12 feet. So we'll say that that's my second story. Then we'll say the third floor is also at 12 feet. Or 12 feet. The fourth floor is also at 12 feet. And let's do a few more. Let's just have fun with it. So the fifth, sixth, and we'll say the seventh. We'll say okay. All right. So if you want to see what the building looks like that I've modeled it so far, first off, you know everything is sort of working because if you look over here in the top, do you see how the typical floor is now bolded? See, like if you drop this, see how the typical floor is bolded? What that means is, is that I have created a floor plan and now I'm actually using it in the model. 
Okay? And if you actually render the building, if you click this sort of button right here under prop table where it says 3D view, bam. Okay, so what it's done is it's generated a three-dimensional frame of, of what it is that we've modeled. Okay, so what we've done is we created a floor plan, we're using it over and over and over again, and each time we use it, we're saying it's 12 foot. Like, let me show you something. Let me close this. Okay, let's, let's go into our story layout, and let's have some fun with it. Let's say that this floor height, see how this fourth floor, how we've got 12 feet? Let's, let's be, be silly with it. Let's say it's 50 feet. Okay, so I'm going to hit change. So see how that one's now 50 feet? You see what I did there? So I just went into where I clicked, you know, this one said 50 feet and hit change. Now I'm going to hit OK and I'm going to render it again. Okay? <laughs> see what happened? So, so one floor got way higher than the others. Okay? You see why? Does that make sense? So, okay, now let me go back and fix that because that's going to get a little weird. Okay, so hit change, hit OK. Now, this is not done by any stretch of the imagination because we don't have a, a deck on there at all. We don't have any, any type of, of uh, slab. So what I'm going to go, uh, what I'm going to do now is now we need to start changing some things. Let's go into prop table. So I'm in the prop table and I'm going to go into decking. Okay, so this is where we can start uh, uh, generating either a composite floor system, a non-composite floor system. We can use a concrete slab system, uh, and so on and so forth. So here's our decking. We've got a whole bunch of different decking from, you know, Velcraft, wheeling, and you know, all, all this jazz. We're just going to keep it simple. We're just going to use the one that's the first. I mean, you know, you would need to check this if you were doing an actual real building to ensure that the decking that you're using is making sense, but I'm just trying to show you how the program works. We'll say we're using three-quarter inch diameter studs. Um, let's let's pick some uh, some values that make sense. Okay, so we'll call this the floor slab. Um, let's say concrete thickness above the flutes. Let me show you what's going on there. Um, so, okay, you all in your in your uh, research on these buildings so far have seen what floor slab forms look like. I mean, they're sort of these little metal pans that have got these sort of waves in them, right? Like they, you know, so on and so forth. So let's say that uh, for our slab, let's say the concrete thickness above the flutes is three inches. So that's how thick the slab is above the thickness of those flutes. Does that make sense? So we'll say it's three inches. We'll say the stud, the actual shear stud, we'll say it's four and a half inches long. We'll say this is lightweight concrete, so it's 115 pounds per cubic foot. We'll say 4 KSI concrete. The stud has a, a tensile stress of uh, 65 KSI. We'll say the steel weight itself is 3 pounds per square foot. Everything here, this diaphragm stuff, is for lateral loads. So I'm going to sort of ignore that right now. But for our purposes for this building, we're going to assume that the, the diaphragms are rigid. So I'm not going to even worry about all that and then we'll hit add. So this is me creating a floor slab. Now I'm going to add it to the building. Now, let me show you how that works. Pop quiz, anybody remember what the slab overhang was on this building? Like how far did the slab overhang on, on the edges? Six inches. Okay, all right. So let's go out down to where it says slab. So the first thing we need to do is create the slab edge. So I'm going to say that the slab overhang is six inches, and I'm going to do that on the whole perimeter. And if you zoom in, see how the slab overhangs a little bit? It overhangs six inches. Okay. Now, I, if I wanted to get nifty, I could start creating slab openings. Like, think about this building. Does this building have any slab openings? The, the atrium, right? Think the second floor is a big, you know, concrete slab that extends out the entire building, but it's open right there in the atrium, right? So if I was, if I was modeling the Weisberg Applied Engineering Complex, I'd probably have a big opening right about here, right, throughout every floor. Does that make sense? So you can go in and model a slab opening if you would like, but for us, we don't have to worry about that. 
Now let's go down to layout, slab. Now let's actually assign that deck. So we created a deck. Now we need to assign it to the structure. So assign our floor slab to the whole floor, and bam. Now when I render the structure, now I've got the slab on there. That's a good question. The arrows are just indicating the, the one-way direction of the slab. So we're assuming that the slab bends that way, which is perpendicular to the floor beams, which is tr how everybody designed it anyways. So, so yeah, that's a good question. Does that make sense? Okay, now, we're not quite done because there's one, I mean, if we're going to keep this straightforward, there is one thing that we do need to do, and that's apply a floor load to this system. So this is the, um, this is the floor, so let's keep it simple. Let's say it's an office building, so let's use a reducible load of 80 pounds per square foot, something about like that. So let's go to layout loads, or actually, actually we don't need to go to prop table, we need to actually create a load. We have a surface load, a line load, a point load, and a snow load. So surface loads, now, now first off, what, what do you think the line loads would be for this building? No, now it's going to account for that. What are, the wall, the, the cladding in the wall, we haven't accounted for the wall. Because I once, see, think about what's going on right now. It'll do all the structural analysis to figure out beam reactions and self-weights. What I haven't put on the building yet is the live load and then the wall. So I'm, I'm going to ignore the wall for now, but you all see where I'm going from. I'm going to do a surface load. So we'll say interior live load. Um, I'm not going to add any additional dead load or construction dead load, although I could. Let's do an 80 pounds per square foot load. Let's call it reducible. So this is where I'm just sort of, I could create 50 different loads. I could create interior floor line loads. I could create file storage areas. I could create all sorts of different uh, 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 regions for the building. So we'll hit OK. Now I need to assign those loads. So assign that to the whole floor, and if you notice how it's now yellow, that's it. So now there's the slab and then the live load on top of that. That won't render because it's not part of the building. I just wanted to show you uh, that that's there. Yes. Oh my goodness. No, we're not done. We got, yes. Uh, the, that's a good question. So dead construction loads could be if there's uh, form work on the system that's going to be removed when it's all said and done. If there's any, um, there's, uh, I would say primarily form work uh, that's going to be removed. There's now, one thing to also consider is you've got dead uh, construction loads. There's also live construction loads because the live load on the structure during construction might be different than the live load on the structure when it's finished. That's a good question. It should be in Design Guide 3. If not, it's in one of the other design guides and, and, and we can take a look at it. Now, one thing we haven't generated is the roof. So let me go. So now where it says typical floor, I have done nothing with the roof. I mean, I've assigned the grid, but that's it. I haven't modeled the roof at all. So let me, let me do that. And I'm going to do it really, really quickly. So we'll go to Columns. Add on grid, let's add all the columns, let's go to layout, beams, add on grid, add all of these, but what, what type of beams do we use on the roofs that are different than, than on the floors? We use joists, right? Now joists are going to be like K joists, like those open web joists that you see like if you look at the roof in Walmart. We actually need to tell um, a ram steel that we're using different beams for the uh, uh, for the roof. If you go over here on the left, see where it says steel? See that little drop down menu right there? I'm going to change that to steel joist. Okay. So now let's go into layout, joist, and let's do add generation. Now I'm going to add a few more joists just so everybody's aware. So we'll do five uh, spaces per beam. We'll add 
that way. And if you notice, the, the beams are sort of a darker shade of blue. Those are the open web joists. And we'll be able to zoom in on the structure and see that uh, here in a little bit. Again, if it seems like I'm going fast, again, I'm recording this. So you can, you know, watch and replay and all that jazz. All right. So, no, I, no reason, no reason. Good question. So decking, uh, let's do a non-composite floor system just for the heck, just to be different. So we'll call this a roof system. Um, we'll just say it's 10 pounds per square foot and add that. I don't know, I'm just being different. Okay. Let's do a slab edge. Let's do six inches on the whole perimeter. Let's assign that roof system deck. Wait, hold on, layout. I think I hit the wrong button. Slab, deck assign. Oh, floor, there we go, thank you. Then there you go. So now I've assigned that um, now I've assigned that that non-composite floor system. So now uh, the only thing left to do is I actually have to put the roof on the building. So if I go into stories, see I'm only using the typical floor to actually generate the building. So I actually need to add a roof to the building. We'll put that at 12 feet as well, and add. So now you can see the roof is being used. Uh, if I render it, see how you can see that the see how the the roof joists are being used. Y'all see that? So yeah. So far so good? So, one last thing to do, I'm going to create, what, what am I missing on the roof? Snow. Let's put a snow load on the roof. So let's go to prop table, loads, let's do a snow load. Um, we'll say just so we'll say a 20 pounds per square foot live load or add that, hit OK. You can do drift loads if you want to uh, handle a triangle, triangular distribution. I'm not going to worry about that for this. Hit OK. I need to assign that snow load to the whole floor. Bam. What's that? Oh, goodness. I just went ahead and saved it. Um, one other thing I'm looking for. Give me one sec. Okay. One thing I'm going to do at the very end before I actually model and design the structure, if you look over here on the top, uh, see where it's this one to two thing is? You asked the question about is there a reason why you modeled this this way or, well, no. But one thing I can do is I can go ahead and hit this one to two. And what, it's, what that one to two did is it actually renumbered all of the members. See, the way that RAM tracks these, these beams and columns, it's going to say that this is joist number 336 or what have you. If you hit renumber, it will renumber all of the members in a systematic fashion so that when it's all said and done, they're all the same. So I, I just thought I would mention that. So I'm going to go ahead here, hit renumber, and so on and so forth. The, when you go from floor to floor, the decking uh, uh, doesn't render, but it's still there. So, and there's our building. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so if I close this, and now let me save it. I'll go ahead and do a data check. There's this little data check button right here. Let's hit. Make sure everything's good. No errors or warnings. So that sounds good. Let me close this. Okay. So when I go back to the main window and I just close the model or window, you'll see here, see where it says RAM modeler and it's got a green light? 
That means the structure is modeled and it's ready to go, but one thing we haven't done is designed anything. So if I go into the beam module, if you go over here on the left, it says uh, steel beam, like if you ho uh, hover over, beam design, okay, hit OK, all right, this is just rendering the structure. There's a little button here that you all are going to love and hate, it's called design all, you just click it. Okay, so let's go to the, the second floor. Um, let's see. Show designs. So, <laughs> I'm so Al, stop. You stop with that. Um, I'm curious, for, for those of you paying attention, all right, so the W18 by 35, what do you think the number 20 means? Nope. Nope, nope. Finish that. What were we going to say? Amount of what? No. The W18 by 35 is only referencing this element. Th yeah, this is for the second story. What goes on top of that beam if it's composite? What goes between the slab and the beam? What goes on the top flange? The studs, the number of studs. That beam has 20 studs on it. No. The C is the camber. So now here's the thing. This design would not be adequate as is. I didn't put a wall load on it. You know, there's that. But let me let me tell you something. If you run RAM for your building, you're going to get smaller beam sizes, guaranteed. The reason why is because your design did not incorporate composite action. So your beams should be bigger than what RAM spits out. What? Listen, listen. The alternatives phase is meant to be a little more rigorous than the final design phase. Think, when it's all said and done, you all are going to be able to walk into a room and say, you, you damn right I earned my college degree. <laughs> oh, God. One more, one more. If you go into column design, design all. The colors are your performance ratios. Uh, it, hold on. So, here's your scale. Anything that's orange is like 0.95 to 1 on a performance indica indicator? No. They're, they're, they're way larger than necessary. Exactly, because they're not seeing much load. All right, we're raising some good points. Let me show you a couple things. If you go into the modeler, 
if you go into story layout, one of the things that I didn't mention was we're assuming all of these are splice levels. That means that they're separate column pieces for every story. If I say no, then what it's going to do is extend that column size along the story. Do you see what I mean? So if I said no, it would assume the same column size from ground to roof. Does that make sense? Now, we're not quite done because I want to show you something. Okay, so let me go to the floor system and like I said, show designs. Okay, if you go to, I think it's reports go to a single beam design report and let's say we're looking at this one okay so here's the line loads the um, uh, you know we've got the composite properties let's see the nominal moment capacity this is the nominal moment capacity of this beam 122.19 foot kips um, we've got Line loads, we've got moments, so this is 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. The design moment is 108.6 uh, foot kips. The FEMN is 109.97, so that indicates that beam is sufficient. Do I need to, like, stay away from the parking lot? So? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, listen. There is a reason that you went through all of that. It's so that, A, you all could legitimately make the decision that steel was the most, uh, was the most economical. You all, here's the, th here's the thing, here's the thing. The second thing is, by going through that whole process, when you run RAM, you're going to have a gut feeling as to whether or not your output is right because you all went through the work. If not, what would have happened is I would have given you this program, you would have put some numbers in, it would have spit out an answer, and you said, oh, that's good. And, and if you went and built that building and it fell down and killed somebody? You're on your way. <laughs> There was a story that broke, there was a water slide, I think it was, did anybody hear about the water slide that, that like, it, uh, the people who designed it didn't have their license at all, and then, like, no, I mean, like, people died on it. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, seriously, there were people that died on it, they didn't have their license. Look, there is something to be said about going through the process by hand once so that you all understand the output. Um, the final design phase will be a little easier with RAM. You know, the amount of significant work output will calm down a bit. Um, but I, if I would give you a piece of advice between now and, say, the end of this week, if you haven't downloaded RAM yet, I would. Um, you need to download that. You need to start generating the model for your building. If you can do this and go through the tutorial, you should have no problems whatsoever modeling your structure, okay? Um, Sometime by the end of business today, I'm going to send the reports their comments. Um, what's the last thing? Yeah, there was something else I needed you all to do. Oh, yeah, you need uh, the, the evaluation stuff. Yes. I opened it back. Again, I opened it back up. I want them in by 5 o'clock today. If I am missing your team evaluation on Blackboard by 5 o'clock today, you get a zero. What's that? I'm not, I'm not going to do that for the alternative space because I didn't say I would, but, um, but, but let, me, let me say this. Let me say this. We're going to have our final design pr presentation, and then you all are really going to be tempted to forget that. I am going to dock you for the final one if I don't get it for the final. So, yeah. Yes, before we leave. Can you also do, like, grid design? Can you draw, like, numbers? No. 
No, that's a good question. You cannot do bridges in RAM steel because RAM steel is not an influence line analysis package. It's not what it's intended to do. I know that, that we've, we've mentioned live loads being transient, you know, that, that they're not always there, but the facts are we handle live loads in building design as static, as they really don't move. Uh, or at least more often than not, we handle them as static. Um, it's not like bridges where we have to use influence lines to determine moment and shear envelopes. This would not be the package for that. There are similar packages for bridges. This is not the one to use. No, actually, actually no. Um, I'll say two things about that. Um, your analysis that you did for the bridge was fine from a serviceability standpoint. In other words, would it deflect? But what you didn't handle was strength. Would it fail? So, and it's not even just the, the connection failing, there's a buckling aspect to it as well. So. But yeah, it was certainly stiff enough, so. Yeah. Sound good? So yeah, let, let me just say this. The, the, the grand amount of work for this course is, is, is a little bit over. Like, you, everybody's like, oh, we, you put us through all this work. Yeah, but for the next couple months, your last couple of months in college, it's come. One and a half. You're like, hold on, it's 32 days. <laughs> it's going to feel like that, trust me. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this, let me ask you this. Would you all prefer like a massive amount of work due at the very, very end or have a bunch of work due in the middle and then now you can kind of relax a little bit? Thank you. I'm not completely crazy. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me stop the recording because we're done with, with Ram Steel. So.